Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar on the Juno portable magnifier. Thank you for joining us today. This is all about the Juno. We're asking the question, do you know Juno? We're going to answer your FAQs today in this webinar, and uh, we'll make this point again later on, but there are a lot of questions we're going to be answering today. So there's a possibility if we don't get through them all or if more questions come in the chat that this might be the first of a series of two or three webinars, but right now you're here for Do You Know Juno? Get your FAQs answered. Thank you for joining us today. Let's get our opening poll questions up and running for you. We're going to ask you the basic questions that we always like to ask to start a webinar. What your job title is, where you're from, and how you heard about the webinar. And then our content specific questions we want to know, have you purchased a Juno? That's a just a yes or no question. We want to know what populations are you using the Juno with? So choose all that would apply here. Uh, if you're using it with students in elementary school, uh, students in middle or high school, transition age students, adults, or not applicable. And our final poll question is, are you familiar with optical character recognition, OCR, or scanning and reading? Any of those terms, they all mean the same thing. And that's a simple yes or no question. Uh, let's get to some things you need to know before we get started in the webinar today. Place your questions in the chat. Uh, we definitely will keep that open. Uh, there will be demos going on, and uh, the chat could be closed during that period of time, but there'll be plenty of opportunity to put those questions in that chat box today. One and a half hours ACVREP credit and Betsy Ann will give you the code shortly. And we do have our closed captioning available today. Uh, we do have three presenters today. First is Greg Stilson from APH. He's our Senior Director of Global Innovation. Also, Mike Wood is with us, the Strategic Accounts Manager for Education for Vespero. And then finally, Justine Taylor from APH, Low Vision Product Manager. So all of them will be interacting and talking, and they'll be answering and asking questions, and I'll be throwing in some questions as well. Let's talk about some challenges, some things that you may have faced or may face if you do have a Juno. Getting that Juno customized to fit a student's needs requires several steps. So we're going to go through those today so you know how to customize it better. It's important to set the Juno up properly to get the best results. Yeah, the needs are going to differ depending on the individual. So we'll talk about how best to customize it. With so many features, you might be missing a key attribute that would best serve a student. It's one of those things you don't always know what it can do until you, you get out there and, and get the opportunity to use it. And today we hope to take some of that learning curve away for you, especially if you're new to the Juno. It's easy to assume something's broken or not working correctly when you don't know how to operate all the features. And finally, teachers are gonna to need to factor or reset their Juno at the end of the year. That's a common thing, it's gonna to go to a new student, you may have to reset it, and we'll talk about how that is done. Our learning objectives, uh, that is coming. The opening code is coming in just a moment. Uh, our learning objectives today, we're going to identify when OCR is useful throughout the school day. We're going to compare two reading views on the Juno. We'll learn how to save and open a document using the Juno. We'll explain how to customize the Juno for a specific student. Hey, thanks very much, Betsy Ann. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, this is exciting. The Juno is a newer product, of course, released through the American Printing House for the Blind. And myself and a bunch of people here at Vespero worked with them to create this product. So we're excited to share the information. Uh, we've had lots of great questions come in. I know, so APH was excited to ask me, and I think we're going to play kind of a secret stump Mike Wood game today because <laughs> I may not be able to answer all of them, but I hope I can. I did see one question in the chat already that I will answer. We will not have many slides today. It's gonna to be more of a live uh, demo. It will be archived, so you can go back and watch it, or you can reach out to any one of us here on the call today if you have questions you know, moving forward. But um, 
yeah, so without further ado, I'd say let's get into the questions and see where we're at. I pass that over to Justine. I think you, the first question asker, right? Yes, I'm kicking us off here with some basic uh, questions. Uh, our first one is, can you walk us through um, how the Juno works? Yeah, so this is, that's the layout. Right? I'm glad we started easy here. <laughs> so I can. So what I'm gonna do is actually hold this up to the uh, screen and just kind of walk you through the device. So this device here, thanks for spotlighting me there, Betsy Ann. So when you look at the device here, you know, it's, it's pretty slim, uh, lightweight. And at the top, you've got a camera that actually rotates. So this barrel camera will actually rotate for you. Uh, if I were to move down the, for me, it's actually, if you're looking at the unit, it's the right-hand side. Um, so, well, let me start over on the left, actually. So on the left-hand side, because this is the most important, is the power button. So up in the top left is your power button. Below that is going to be your color modes. So you're going to cycle between your color modes. So if you have high contrast options, which you'll see, I'm sure later on we'll probably get into um, demoing like some of the functionality of how to change your color contrasts. These will toggle you between those. Moving over to the other side, top button is your capture button. So this allows you to capture an image or return back to live view if you tap it a second time. Below that, there's yellow buttons with a plus and a minus. These are your magnification or zoom buttons. So these are gonna allow you to increase or decrease your zoom. Uh, plus obviously is gonna increase, so zoom in. Minus will zoom out. Other thing I do like is, so the power button on this is recessed. So it's easy to feel that it is recessed. And then each one of these other buttons does have a dot on it. So you can feel, so like the minus one is at the bottom, the plus one is up at the top, and then you know, you'd know that the camera is up here on the very top of that. And the same with the contrast. So those contrast buttons are below the power button. Um, and those have dots as well. As far as other things on this or ports and such, uh, on the left-hand side, if you're looking at the unit, is actually an LED light that lets you know, so while you're charging it, uh, while it's charging, that'll show red if it needs to be charged. It will show green when it is fully charged. And then below that is a mini HDMI. It does come with the cable for that. And then below that is your USB-C. And then below that is your audio jack. Um, so you can plug in an audio jack because of course this does offer the OCR, which was one of the questions on that poll was OCR, optical character recognition. This does have scanning and reading. So if you are in a classroom setting or maybe you're in a library or you're at home and you don't wanna disturb anybody else with it, you can plug in a headset. And I do wanna give you a little heads up as well. So that HDMI port, the mini HDMI, I'm gonna be actually showing a lot of the screen. So instead of holding this up and showing you it this way, which would be one, uncomfortable for me, and two, it doesn't give you the best view as the viewer, I'm actually gonna plug this unit into my laptop and stream this through Zoom. So you'll have an exact view of what I'm seeing on the screen. Uh, you will not see the buttons at that point. So just picture these buttons now and pretend you see them later. <laughs> Next question, Justine. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, our next questions are gonna be go um, asking how um, about using the camera. So how do you know if the Juno um, has changed into that different viewing mode when you're turning the camera. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so you've got a couple of different viewing modes on this and I just turned my Juno on. So you'll, you just heard kind of a little fancy noise and APH logo. So you've got a couple of different um, reading modes or, or I should say camera positions really. So you have the reading position, which when you open the built-in reading stand, uh, the camera actually flips right into that reading position. So that camera that we can move, the barrel camera, let me power it off just so the lights don't glare on that screen. Um, when you do that, it pops right into that reading position. You then also have a text recognition camera mode. So if I close that reading stand and I wanted to scan something, say 
maybe a full eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, the camera mode, the camera is gonna move into kind of a straight out mode that way. You then have a distance mode. So if you were sitting in a classroom setting or you're at work and you wanna see somebody across the table or the teacher at the front of the room, with the reading stand open, that camera can actually pivot and you would just face that out directly straight instead of where it's normally facing down in the reading mode because it's looking at what's below it. You would just twist that camera to look straight out at distance mode. There's a neat feature in this uh, that when it was developed called the handwriting and ho or hobby mode. So that's kind of a sweet spot in between the reading and the distance mode. And when you have it on, and I will show this when we plug it in live, um, that actually gives you optimal focus to if you were say threading a needle, if you were uh, knitting, if you were maybe, I don't even know, doing um, some type of a hobby where you need to see something small. And you also have a self view mode. So if I pivot that camera all the way around, it will actually do self viewing and be able to see myself. And you then also have um, a writing mode. So in between the reading mode, you can pivot that camera out a little bit and you actually can write behind it and you'll be able to see, and I will demo this live when I plug this in. Uh, and then if you wanted to, you can also use this with the camera, excuse me, the reading stand closed. The camera will go into the spotting mode and this would be used for if you're maybe at a restaurant uh, and you're looking up at the menu, say a fast food restaurant, or you're just spotting around the room to see something. And, you know, Justine, you may correct me if I'm wrong on this, but somebody asked, I saw in the chat there, you know, what distance would you recommend? I usually tell people about eight to 10 feet is really the distance sweet spot. Um, I know you are included in the development of this as well. So you may be correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I usually tell people eight to 10 feet. Yeah, I um, no more than 15 feet. It's not gonna see like, you know, 20, 30 feet, something small, you know, on the board. It's It, it needs to be about 10, 15 feet. Yeah. yeah, and that's what I would say for Max. You know, you'll notice the difference and you can zoom in, of course, using that when you, when you are doing the distance, but uh, there is definitely that sweet spot of distance. So you don't wanna be sitting at the very back of the room and try and view the teacher from across the room. So I think, did that answer that question as far as the different camera modes? Yes, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Next, next one is, when should I hold the device uh, to view versus when should I use the stand? Great question, great question. So anytime that you are reading text, whether it be on say a handout from a teacher or maybe a pamphlet at work, um, or you're reading a textbook, magazine, you name it. I recommend using the reading stand. One, because it, you're gonna get tired if you had to hold this over the text the entire time. Two, because you're gonna get your optimal distance from the text, and you can easily glide this across the material. So the stand is smooth. So if you had this on, say, a magazine or book or something, this is going to glide very smoothly across your text and it gives you that optimal distance. Um, so reading, use the reading stand. If you are doing self-viewing, the same thing. It's easy to sit this on the desk, table, you know, if you're doing makeup or maybe you're checking to see like right before this meeting, I had an eyelash in my eye and I was like, <laughs> what's going on? I'm not gonna, I'm gonna look like I have like one red eye. Um, so if you were doing that, you would sit this down on the table, and pivot that camera all the way around to self-facing view. So then you have use of both of your hands. You can just look in, you know, look at the camera. You can then zoom in, zoom out if you need to do that. Um, recommend, again, if you're at a restaurant looking at uh, a menu board, or maybe you're traveling on the MBTA or the, the T, depending on different states, I'm naming different public transit um, systems. You know, if you're taking a train or a bus, I would say close the reading stand and then you're able to hold this and hold this right up to the um, schedule. Maybe if it's on the wall or if it's on a TV somewhere, you can do that. When you are scanning, if you're scanning an entire page, you then want to close the reading stand and you want to then hold that camera that way over the material. 
to capture that entire page. Uh, if you're scanning just a small section of text that you have while you're reading, you know, while the reading stand is open, you can do that as well. But those would be when I would either keep it open or closed the reading stand. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Um, our last question about the camera is how do you capture a full page, which you kind of spoke about a little bit, but do you want to talk about how you can turn it into like portrait and landscape and absolutely yeah thanks Justine. Rotated. so yeah and i did see some questions pop up so i'll answer this question that you just asked me first and then i'll go to the uh, chat to answer a couple of the questions in there too so one of the things i find when i'm using the uh, juno is you know when you're holding it over the material if your page is so for example i've got a uh, reader's digest magazine which is longer versus taller right it's or wider versus taller. Um, so I can hold the Juno the way that I would hold it while I was in the reading stand. So I'm gonna hold it horizontally. But if I wanted to maybe take just one page of this magazine and not the entire, both pages, I can then hold this, um, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? Vertically um, or more of like- Portrait, a, yeah. Portrait, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And you can hold it portrait mode instead of landscape mode. And holding it that way, I can then visually see that I'm capturing just that one side of the magazine, which does make it a little easier. Um, but I find that doing an entire page, you do want to hold this. And you probably want to hold it about eight inches or so above the page. Um, you may have to go a little higher, depending on the size of the, the document that you're trying to scan in. Um, and then I've also found that if you're noticing that it might look like it's out of focus, just tap the screen once, uh, whether it be in the middle or wherever, and then it will kind of come into focus. And then you would hit that red snap button and that will capture the image and, and run the OCR basically. All right, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. We're and gonna... before... Oh, yeah, we got a poll question. Yeah, oh, absolutely. cool, all right, great. So I'm gonna launch this poll question um, yeah. that Paul will read out to our group. And then Mike, you've seen, we have so many questions in the chat. Thank you guys for being so responsive today. We'll take a minute to answer some of those that come in while you're filling out this poll question. And this is a true or false question. Uh, the Juno can capture a full page of text, true or false? The Juno can capture a full page of text. Is that true or is that false? And everybody in that crowd, I am counting on you. If you answer this incorrectly, then that means I did a really bad job at explaining things. So <laughs> I'm with you. Come on. All right. So I can stop share and Mike, we can go through some of those questions that came in sure the thing. chat. All right, so I'm gonna scroll back on up. The first question that came in was, does ambient lighting affect the viewing on the Juno? So the Juno has built-in lights. Uh, it has built-in lights for when it's in the reading mode. And so you've also got lights on the sides here and then there's some lighting on the camera. But I find with any magnifier, I find that ambient lighting does make a difference. And, you know, depending on, I was just chatting with a TVI friend of mine the other day and she was saying, you know, that the fluorescent lights in her classroom are horrific for some of the low vision kiddos, right? And so she bought some different lights that offer different temperatures. So I would say yes, and you know, Justine or Greg, I know both of you might have some input on this as well, but I do find that depending on the ambient lighting, it can make or break certain things or make a difference, I should say. Uh, but this does have the built-in lighting, so it does do a good job. And I, I mean, my, my office here isn't the best lit, and last night I was uh, playing around with this in my living room, kind of in the, you know, a, a badly lit room, and, uh, and it was doing really well, but ambient lighting can help sometimes if you just add a little extra lighting. I think specifically with OCR, it's a, it's a big game changer, however, how much light you have, um, because the scanning and reading is dependent on how much light it's, it's letting in to, to be able to see those characters properly. Yeah. Having said that, um, I think the, and Justine, you use the live mode a lot more than I do because my vision is poor enough that it doesn't do a whole lot for me. But um, with the OCR, I noticed that here in my office where I just have one light, um, I was getting worse um, worse uh, results than if I did it in my kitchen where I had better overhead lighting, so. 
Well, thank you for that question. The next question is, is there a guide to keep the device straight as it is used to scan? There isn't really a, uh, any guide on it to keep it straight. So, you know, visually you can kind of see what it's scanning in on the screen itself. Um, and then if you held it up over the page, you know, for the most part, uh, it's going to just be more, you're going to have to guide it by just viewing what's there on the, you know, on the screen right before you hit the capture button. Great. And this one I think is going to be a great question for Justine. Um, the question is, is the Juno available through quota funds? And yes, it is available through quota funds. But if so, is there a low vision eval needed that recommends the use of one? Um, a low vision evaluation, but we have the functional vision assessment. Is that what the question is asking? Uh, yeah, so the question is, is a, is a low vision eval needed that recommends the use of one? The use of the Juno? Yes, I think in particular. Okay, um, I would do more of an AT assessment, assistive technology assessment. Um, for the Juno, because it is, a, you know, a piece of technology. Um, and then the, the functional or low vision evaluation, um, you know, is going to get their acuity, their eye condition, their, you know, what kind of reading text, um, if they need OCR, that sort of thing. So that would also help identify, you know, evaluating, assessing the student, their needs, and then um, that will help you justify like this Juno has these features that are going to help this student. Um, so that assessment will definitely back up um, if you're if you're wanting to get a Juno for a particular student. Does that answer? I would question? say that might differ school district to school district or mm -hmm. place to place, I'm assuming as well, because certain places might require that or have to request that it's in the IEP. Um, in order to purchase it, I'm sure depend, you know, I've dealt with so many different schools that have everywhere so different. Absolutely. And we'll do one more question. Thank you for putting these questions in the chat. I will save these for the next time we have a poll question. We will start with your questions. But before we move on, does the OCR function work if it's in portrait mode? Yes. Yeah. So it'll work in both uh, landscape and portrait mode. You can scan into the OCR with that. Yep. All right. Well, uh, we've got the results of our poll question in. Mike, this was the test, the make or break, if we yes. can stump, stump our audience, uh, if Mike had done a good job. So true or false, the Juno can capture a full page of text. 100% of respondents said true. Oh, good. You didn't let me down. Thanks, everybody. Yay. You. <laughs> <laughs> they got it. They got it. All right. So we'll turn it back over um, to Justine and Mike. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we've got a couple, uh, a few questions here about the language um, that's on Juno. So how do I change Juno's voice um, and set those preferences for the, the speech rates and the volume and those settings? All right. So for this, uh, give me a sec. I'm going to actually just plug in my HDMI, uh, my mini HDMI to the side of the Juno here. And so I'll show you visually there on the side. I just plug that right in. And I'm going to switch over to the Juno. So you'll get rid of my um, lovely mug here and you'll get to see the Juno. So give me two seconds. All right. So what you're viewing now is actually the screen of my Juno. Uh, this is exactly what I see on the screen. You'll notice down on the bottom left-hand side, you basically have what I call kind of your, your menu button. Uh, that's gonna bring you into where you can customize any of your settings and so on and so forth. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna tap on that. And when I tap that button, you'll notice some options pop up on the left and right-hand side of the screen for me, right? And so the question you asked was uh, about the voice and setting your preference for speech speed. Uh, so to do that, on the left-hand side, the middle button, and again, this is a touch screen. I didn't mention that earlier. You do have your tactile buttons on the front of this unit, but it is a touch screen as well. So I'm gonna tap on that 
middle button that looks like a speaker. And when I tap on that, uh, you'll notice on the left-hand side here, I have kind of a, um, a bar where I can move up or down that bar. I don't know the technical terms for these, uh, but I've got the option where I can slide that up or down. And that's gonna give me my volume. And you get kind of a little noise to signify, you know, what, what point of volume you're at. And then as far as the rate of speech, do you wanna be the tortoise or the hare? And the hare is gonna be faster, so faster up the top. And the tortoise is a little bit slower down the bottom. So you can just move that. And it actually reads to you. So I'm gonna turn the volume up and I'm gonna move this closer to my laptop just for a second. So I moved it up and down. You could hear that it does give you a sample. So you get a sample of how fast uh, is set. or slow it's going to read for you. And if you wanna turn audio totally off the bottom left-hand side, you'll notice when I click on that speaker, a little slash comes through it and says you are in mute mode or you're back to you know, having audio. So that's that there. And then to get out of that, I just click up on the top right of that on the X and that's gonna bring me right back to um, my main screen. All right, um, do you wanna show them how to change the, the voices? Oh yeah, sure thing. So on the top left-hand side, you'll notice there's three lines. That's gonna bring me to my menu option. So we're now in the main menu. And on the bottom right-hand side, there's a button that um, is kind of like a cog. So settings feature. And when I click on that, I get into my settings menu. And on the top left-hand side, I, oh, I don't wanna do that one, right? I wanna do the right-hand side. And the right-hand side one brings me to my settings and text settings. And the top right-hand button there brings me to my Juno voice. So this is the voice that it's gonna be reading back to you in. And you have a bunch of different options in here. So you've got Tom US voice, Ava US voice. You've got male and female options. You've got Great British, you know, Great Britain, excuse me. So British voices, Australian and you're just gonna kind of scroll right through those. And so I'm gonna stick with Ava. To get out of this menu, on the bottom left, you just click that arrow that's gonna circle you back and circle you back again, and then circle you back again to the main menu, and then finally circle you back to your live image again. Yes. Um I gotta say, I love the Juno, you know, I love all the icons and all the, I think it was really great when they developed that. They were so ingenious and creative on creating all those icons. Um, and if you turn on the menu, the spoken menus, it'll read all the text and the icons. So you can kind of get familiar with the layout of the menus. And yeah, that's you know, our yeah. questions is, um, can you, um, change the voice, um, the menu voice, can you turn that on and off? And you know, that's a great question, Justine. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, you made a great point there and I'm glad you brought that up. So inside of the settings, and then I believe it was in, uh, oh, nope, sorry, give me a second here. I'm forgetting how to get into my speech settings there to talking menu, yeah, so. It was, so from my main menu, I click on the bottom right-hand side to get into my settings. And then on the top right-hand side, I click on the setting there. And then on the left-hand side of this menu setting, I click on, it looks like kind of a, a chat box with some lines in it. When I click on speech that, bubble. yeah, speech bubble, thank you. It gives us the talking menu option. And this is a super cool feature just because of the fact of what if you're not sure of what these buttons are and you want to turn on the talking menu option? So I'm going to turn that on for a second here. And I'm going to hit the back button. And that's giving me my, telling me my previous screen. So when I click on the button. Previous screen. And can you hear that okay? Yes. Okay, great. So it tells me previous screen. Well, if I want to activate that button, I have to double tap it. Previous. And then that activates the button. I think this is a super great feature. So same thing here. I'm going to click on 
the bottom left button here, which is a contrast setting. Color themes. And that's your color themes. Now, if I wanted to activate that, I double click on it. Color. And Previous screen. Previous screen. Double click again. So I'm going to go back in to shut off my talking menu. But if I click on that top. Talking menu. Left button. Once it tells me what it is, double tap it. Talking. It activates it. Talking menus toggle switch currently set to on. So it's telling me my talking menu is currently set to on. If I double tap that, talking. it's going to shut it off. And then I can just go back to single tapping to get out of all of my options and menus there. And I'm going back to my live view now. All right. Yeah. So super helpful, the talking menus. Um, I really like it. Uh, so one of our other questions we have is, um, what are the languages on the Juno? And um, how do you change the, the Juno into the different language? Sure. So you've got a couple of different languages. Uh, you've got English, Spanish, French, German, and Chinese. Uh, you've got both Hong Kong simplified, Taiwan, and mainland simplified. So you've got a couple of different options there. And we're going to go into our menu option again. So I click on that bottom left-hand side there. And I'm going to then click up on my top left to get into the menus. I'm going to then click on my settings. And if I click on my top left-hand side, that's going to be my reading settings. Um, and actually, in reading settings, on the right-hand side, you can then get into select your reading language. And so in here, you've got English. Spanish, French, so just like I had mentioned earlier. Um, so then to select that, we would just click on the bottom right-hand side. And then when we choose that, it then gives us the option, well, which voice did you wanna use in the English language? So if I wanna keep Ava, I would just then click the bottom right-hand side again to select that. And it brings me back to my reading settings of where to choose my voice. Great question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Justine. Those were uh, those were good. I don't think I was stumped yet, but there's still many yeah, more I'm sure did, out there. Did a great job. We're going to pass it over to Paul for customization. All right. So we are now on double jeopardy or round two of let's stump Mike. <laughs> so the questions get harder and worth more money. So uh, let's talk about customization and, and in general first, Mike, how do you customize the Juno? Yeah, great question, Paul. So, you know, some of the ways that I would customize this uh, if I were meeting with a student would be customizing, you're gonna customize the rate of speech like we did, right? Earlier with Justine's question about uh, the speed of the voice, maybe the volume, that's gonna be dependent on the student. You're also going to customize this via the color contrast options that you have in here. So if you have a student that needs high contrast color modes, you might want to pick and choose what color modes you're going to set that with originally before giving it to the student. Uh, some of the other stuff that I would customize on this is obviously the voice, right? Does this person, I mean, gosh, I remember over the years meeting with different students, you know, some of them love male voices, some of them love female voices. Sometimes they love having a British accent. And you know what my thought is, hey, if this works for that student, let them do it. I mean, if they're going to pay attention and absorb that information that they're trying to read and they're using a British voice, what does it matter? Let them do it. Uh, so those are some of the ways that you would customize it. Um, I would say would be a uh, color contrast, rate of speech. And, uh, you know, then in the OCR mode, you've got some options as far as, you know, how it reads things back to you as well. So you can have it read back to you in a couple different modes. Um, you know, whether it be maybe a zone, which is really nice, and I can show that afterwards, um, or a teleprompter. So if somebody has, you know, some, whether it be processing issues or maybe um, ADHD with focusing in on a specific text, I always tell people, you know, when you're using OCR, you're scanning in, say you scan in a full eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, and your student already has some vision issues, but what if they have some, you know, learning disabilities on top of that, right? Maybe they're struggling, or maybe their vision's to the point where, you know, they look at an entire page of text and it's overwhelming. It's like, whoa, this is a lot for me to read. Um, 
you know, you can set this to where it's going to read it more like either a teleprompter to get rid of the visual stuff or as a ticker tape. So kind of like your stock market ticker tape, where it's just going to be one line of text reading across, which sometimes I find takes away some of that anxiety um, of looking at an entire page of text and being so overwhelmed by it. Uh, so those are some ways that you could definitely customize it, I would say. Thanks, Mike. Can you talk more specifically then about customizing the colors? Yeah, sure thing. Yeah. So uh, again, we'll go into the setting, you know, or into our menu. So on the bottom left, and then on the top left, I'm going to click on that menu button again. So we're in our main menu. And if I want to click on our settings button on the bottom right hand side, and then on the top right, I can click on the settings to get into our menu settings there. And on the bottom left, I'm gonna click on my color themes. So inside the color theme option here, you'll notice that right now I've got yellow on black. So this is scrolling through to let me know. Um, and it says dark yellow on black. Below that is black on dark yellow. So as it's scrolling, I'm reading it. Um, and if I wanted that as an option for the student or this individual, I just click right there next to it and check that off. If I wanna get rid of the yellow on black, just click that away. What if I wanted a brighter yellow on black? Just click that away, on or off, quick and easy, just touch screen, select the ones you want. You've got green on black, black on green, yellow on blue, blue on yellow white on blue, blue on white, blue on black, black on blue, as long as no one is black and blue, we're safe. Um, amber on black, black on amber, red on black, black on red, violet on black, black on violet, white on red. I don't even know, Justine, you may know, there's probably so many we could be here for the rest of the hour and a half scrolling through. <laughs> Yeah, there's like 24, 25 different color contrast options. Um, there's a lot of colors. Um, it's got the cyan um, and, bl and black and red and all the, all the colors. Um, and you can change the color theme of the menus. And also you can pick which ones you want to put on the, to scroll through when you hit the, the button to change the color contrast mode. So you can set if there's only two the student likes, so you don't have to scroll through all of them. You can just set the two that they like to switch between. So they can just hit that button um, and switch between those. But you can also change the, it can be a different color theme for just the menus, if it's easier for them to see the, uh, the icons with a certain color contrast. Which I think is great, the fact that you can customize it to that degree and that level. And I like the fact that, you know, when you're using this on the left-hand side, again, you've got those blue buttons that toggle you, you know, or, or cycle you through those um, preset colors as far as the contrast modes. And being able to cut out those that they don't like is really nice because you don't want to have to have to cycle through stuff that you don't use. Uh, so that limits, you know, and also it limits them to the amount of stuff that they're going to be playing with it at some point as well. So that would be how you would customize those color themes. And I'm gonna just cycle back out of this, back to my main main page. Thanks, Paul. Perfect, so we've already talked a little bit about the use of the talking menus. Is there anything else to say about that? If not, we'll move on to the next topic. Uh, no, I think uh, we covered how to turn that on. And again, I'll just reiterate that that is a great feature. And I even find it helpful because I have, you know, one thing I, I have to say is this came out during all of this COVID madness, right? Where we're all not out in the field and a normal day-to-day -day for me and Greg and Justine is, you know, we're meeting with customers more often, you know, we're meeting with the teachers and the end users. And um, so doing this virtually is a little bit different. And this came out during all the chaos. So I haven't really played with it as much as I should have. So that talking menu is nice to be able to turn that on. And then I don't have to go and open up my, you know, user guide and look through to see what some of these things are. I can do it right on the fly, right from the device. So it's nice. So 
Right. Perfect. Yep. Let, let's let's talk about some reading functions here. Two features I'd like you to demonstrate for us, if you would, guidelines and masking. And as you're doing that, can you talk about how users can benefit from those two features? Yes. Yeah, so these are two of my favorite features, I think, on magnifiers. And I'm so glad that the Juno incorporated these in there. So I remember um, being at conferences when I'd meet people that come over and, you know, I'd show them a magnifier like the Juno, if I were showing them the Juno, I would show this feature because this is great. So right now on the screen, I've got, you know, two columns of text, right? This is in my good old Reader's Digest um, magazine. Yes, inside I am probably a 90 year old woman. So I love my Reader's Digest. <laughs> so if I click on the bottom left hand side, I get my menu button. And on the right hand side here, you'll notice there in the middle, there is a box with three letter A's and a line underneath it. That's gonna give me my option to add a guideline. I love the fact of having a guideline because if I'm reading along on text, it's very easy to lose where I'm at, my place, right? Here I'm back to a lot full screen. If I'm reading along left to right, I'm easily now able to guide this. And if I were using say even, uh, you know, something with more text that's larger than just this um, let me find here, I've got another page, I'm sure here somewhere on my desk that I can show you this. Um, I'm always so hesitant with certain, so like grabbing a book off my bookcase, I was just reading Phyllis Diller's um, life, you know, <laughs> biography. And I don't know if I'm gonna go to a, a joke that she said that was bad. So here's my um, magazine. So as I'm reading along, I'm able to easily guide that along and now I'm down to the next line. So for tracking purposes, that guideline is wonderful. Now I'm touching the screen right now and I'm also able to move this guideline myself. So if I'm reading this paragraph and I, oh, I'm down to the next line, if I'm zooming in, you'll notice it makes an even bigger difference because now as I'm reading, I get to the end of that line. I can easily drop this down slide to my left and find that's where I want to be at. So now coming back into um, the menu option, I've got my guideline. If I want to click that button again on the far right hand side, that actually now adds masking. Masking is wonderful for those that have visual clutter issues, um, again for tracking. So I'm reading along, I want to move down to my next line. This cuts out all of that other chaos on the page sometimes and just lets them focus in on that material or that text that's important to them. I can increase or decrease the size of that by just pinching on the screen. So the same way you do on your you know, Android or iPhone, uh, just pinch and zoom. I can move that up or down if I just tap the screen and drag my finger up or down the screen. And that lets me decide where I wanna be using that that way. So really nice and easy on that as well. And I'm getting my battery warning. So I'm gonna plug myself in here for a second. Um, and so that's really nice. And then if you tap that button again, it brings you back to your main page and quickly and easily cycles you through guideline and masking. Again, I, I love those. Justine, you may be able to even mention some stuff. You know, you've used the Juno and what have you used the guideline and masking for? Um, yeah, just like you said, just to, you know, if I want to just focus in on a specific area of the page, I really like how the masking, you can adjust the size of that window. So if I'm reading like a recipe or, you know, a lengthy document with a lot of columns and I just want to focus on, you know, a certain section, I can, you know, quickly turn that masking on and just have it show me that one little section, I can capture um, that image and freeze it. So if I'm walking over to stir the pot on the stove or something and I need to check my recipe, I can have the picture of that recipe just with that little snapshot of that section. Um, so yeah, it's, it's super helpful. I, I, I'm really glad that we, we had that included. Yeah, I would agree. I really like that functionality, that, that feature. So thanks. All right. Uh, can you show us some different ways that Juno can read text to a student? 
Yeah, sure thing. Um, so inside of here, if I go into my menu option again, and I go to my settings, and click on settings, and on the top left, my reading settings, I click on the eye that gives me my different viewing modes. And I did just see a question pop up. I, we, um, I will definitely show scanning on this as well later. I, I'll, I will show scanning for sure. Um, so right now you've got a couple of different viewing modes. So this viewing mode here is basically an exact view I like to call this. So this is the, what I guess you would call the snapshot. Uh, this is the way that it looks on the book, on the page, whatever your material is that you're scanning in. So you would have graphics, images, and things like that, and the text. So you've got that option. On the right-hand side, I'm going to click that to change my viewing mode from that to what you would call the teleprompter. The teleprompter is just going to be a bunch of text, just like a teleprompter would be. A complete paragraph of all the text. It gets rid of all of your visual clutter as far as images and the graphics and things like that. Just going to be text. If I click on that again on the right-hand side, I now get what is called the ticker tape. Um, so this is now, and I'm just dragging my finger to show you. So this is gonna be similar to a stock you know, ticker tape where it's just one complete line of text. So it took all of the text from this document right here and it put it into either a teleprompter mode or into a ticker tape mode. And then, well, I'm in here, I'd also like to show you for the viewing mode. So you can view it, those three options, uh, and then don't forget the zone mode, which you'll see when we do a scan. And then you also can customize when it is in this mode, which is your snapshot mode, do you want it to highlight the word with a box around it, the way that you see uh, lorem, uh, if I'm even pronouncing that Latin right, um, you know, <laughs> you, you've got that box there. Or on the bottom right-hand side, you'll notice where I've got a capital A and a lowercase a, and I've got a little line below them. If I tap that, it switches me to um, a guideline. So you've got a line there. So you'll notice when I'm reading, I'm toggling between a box or a guideline. So there's the guideline. And if I toggle over here, you've got box. You can toggle between guideline and box on the ticker tape and on all of the modes, you can toggle between that. So it lets you do that. All right, thank you for showing us those different modes. And I believe that, Dan, this is a time for our next poll question, am I right? It is. So I'm gonna share my screen and get this poll launched. Okay, this is another true false question. Uh, there are three reading modes on the Juno, true or false. There are three reading modes on the Juno. And while you're answering that question, we're gonna go back and pick up on some of the questions that we missed. Uh, first question, at what age would you recommend that students were best suited for using the Juno? So for me, I, I mean, and Justine, this might be more in your wheelhouse even, but I mean, I kind of feel like um, you know, once they're starting to use even spot reading or looking at picture books, um, and I'm happy to show afterwards, I've got the little red hen book here, which is, you know, one of those little golden books. And I think as young as you would start reading to the, the child, really, because you can start showing them images on there. I remember um, a while back, another APA product is the Video Mag HD, which is a smaller screen device. Uh, it's only like a four inch screen, a 4.3 inch, as opposed to this, which is seven inches. And there was a great story from a student who was reading about wal walruses and looked at an image of a walrus using that and discovered that they have whiskers. They never knew that a walrus had whiskers before because their vision didn't allow them to see well enough to notice that the walrus had them. So, you know, you could use this for, you know, I'd say kindergarten kids uh, with spot reading looking at images um, and so on. And then of course, as they grow older, they'd incorporate more of the features such as the scanning, uh, OCR and things like that. But Justine, what's your thought? And correct me if I'm totally out in left field with that, but that's my, my take on it. No, definitely, definitely K through 12, absolutely. Um, I think any age could, could use the Juno and benefit from it. Um, transition age students, uh, 
you know, working age, you know, people, adults, um, you know, you know, the seniors, any, any age could use Juno, I think, and, and really benefit. But yeah, starting in, in kindergarten for sure. Thanks. Yeah, that's my thought too. Yeah. And kids are so tech savvy. I mean, it's like when I bring stuff into the kids, you know, it's always, I find it's like me or the teachers sometimes that we're like, wait a minute, but the kids just jump right in and, and, and go with it. So, I mean, if you've got a tech savvy student, you know, give it to them, let them try it out, see what their thoughts are. You know, if they're going to use it, wonderful. All right. Uh, the next question was, sometimes the Juno freezes and shows only a black screen. I realized that taking a picture, even if it's black screen, sometimes brings it back to normal. Is there something we may be doing that will freeze the screen and leave it black? So my first initial thought on that is maybe it's going into sleep mode because it does, it does have a timer in there um, that kind of puts it not into a total power off stage, but kind of a, a standby sleep mode. And that would be my guess uh, without knowing. Um, otherwise, I mean, there could be an issue with your unit. I doubt it. I mean, there haven't been, we haven't had any calls in about something like that, but uh, Justine, what's your thought on that? Um, yeah, I would, I would need a little more information. Um, but yeah, definitely if you hit that power button, it's going to take you out of that sleep mode. Um, it's a power saving feature. Um, it, the screen will just go black if you're not using it for a while. Um, but if you're, if you're taking a picture and you're trying to use it and it's going black, then yeah, you're definitely going to want to call customer service and, and get that resolved. And just something that we'll we'll show here at the end is sort of a I would say sort the the hammer method of troubleshooting, which is factory resetting the device entirely. And even though we may not know exactly what's going on with your device, um, you know, doing the factory reset can often fix most of the issues that are coming up in software like that. So um, we can we can definitely walk you through that at the end. Well, thank you for that, Greg. Um, I'm going to go back, look at some of them. Great. So a question was to demonstrate the ticker tape, which we did. That's it. The, the text kind of slowly moving across the screen, just like you would see if you were watching financial news. Um, why is it that you can select multiple color options simultaneously? So I would say that the reason that you would want to be able to select multiple color uh, options would be, you know, depending the individual, depending on what you're reading, sometimes, uh, you know, the colors make a difference. So if you're reading, say, a box of pasta or, a, a you know, a food item uh, where the color of that box might be different than just white with black text, uh, you might want to switch to a different color mode. And it would be easier to just have it saved into your preset, I would find then having to then go into the settings and choose that option and then go back. And so that's where I find that it's helpful to just kind of pick the ones that you use. Uh, and the other thing could be just for your vision. You know, sometimes I find that as your eyes get a little bit more fatigued, um, you know, looking at kind of a white background all the time, you might want that opposite effect of the black background with white text. Um, and so you can just check off those boxes and, and pick which ones you want to have as your preset then. Yeah, Michael Michael's posting here, he's saying, oh, the check boxes added to the presets. The, an the answer is yeah. Basically you saw that there was like 24, 25 color options. You wouldn't want to have to cycle through every single one of those when you press the color button <laughs> every time. No. So this is basically a way for you to preset your favorites uh, when you press those the color button. Great. Right. And we uh, have gotten a lot of requests to demo the OCR and having the device read the test text. We promise we will get to that. But first, we've got about 30 minutes left in this webinar. So I'm going to read out the poll results and we will move forward uh, with some of our frequently asked questions. If you've got a question in the chat we haven't addressed yet, don't worry, we will try and get to it by the end. So for the question, true or false, there are three reading modes on the Juno. 79% said true, 21% said false. So this, this was kind of a tricky question. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike to give us the answer. 
So are there three reading modes on the Juno? And that is, you know, I guess, yes and no, right? Because there's the snapshot, the teleprompter and the ticker tape. So those are the three reading modes um, that you have in there. And then you do have that zone mode when you scan. So it, that was kind of a trick question in a way. We did stump everybody because there's really the four different modes, the zones, the snapshot, the teleprompter, and the ticker tape. All right, thank you, Mike. And I hand it back over to our panel to keep on asking those questions. Sure thing. And just before we get to the next question, I did want to show uh, for that user on the call, the individual that asked about the, um, the screen going black. So if you click on the menu option, so click in menu and then go up to the top left to get into your main menu. Click on the cog down the bottom left to get into the settings and then click on the little um, kind of the profile of the or the silhouette of the man on the bottom left. And that brings you into your user settings. In the middle, you've got your standby time option and that might be, so I would check that first, um, check that. And then if that's not fixing it, call in to customer support or email one of us. Uh, but in there you can choose, you know, do you want it to go to standby mode after 10 minutes, five minutes, three minutes, you know, and then that's more to save the battery or if you were to walk away from your desk for a couple of minutes, it would then go into sleep, standby sleep mode. Uh, so, sorry to cut off I'd the other catch questions. on that one, Mike. Yeah, before we move out of customization, I just wanted to mention that you can um, customize the text size um, and you can adjust the text size in the menu as well. If you just hit the plus and minus mic, you can show it'll increase and decrease the uh, text in your menus. And you can also adjust what text um, you'll be reading in what size as well. Great point, Justine. So I'm doing that right now in the settings menu. And that is, you know. Another way to customize, so yeah. Great point, thank you. All right, everybody's been asking about scanning, so let's talk about it. So can you show us, Mike, the steps to use zones to read a document? I sure can, yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close my reading stand, and I'm going to hold this unit up above this page in the, uh, in the Reader's Digest magazine here. And you'll notice, let me get rid of my wires here. And you'll notice I've got the text. I'm holding mine in portrait mode right now. So that's why it looks sideways on your screen. I'm going to hit that red button to snap that image. And now you'll notice that it is showing this side to side, right? It is showing it sideways. But what I'm going to do is on this screen now, you've got a couple of different options. On the far right, on the right hand side, I should say the middle button is what's going to allow me to then run the OCR engine on this to scan it or basically read it back. So I'm going to click on that. And it's going to do a recognition in progress. Uh, so it's going to run through this page. And what it's doing is it actually picked up a little bit more. So you'll notice here it's breaking these down into zones for me. So you'll see that these are numbered. And this is really nice because I didn't want it to pick up that left-hand side of that page, right? But the way that I was holding it, it did capture a little bit of it. So I want to ignore that. So if I wanted to really start reading up at the top uh, left-hand side of that right-hand page of the Reader's Digest magazine, I can click on zone number five. Of the earliest F enthusiasts was the father of electricity himself, Thomas Edison. And it's underlining and reading that along as it's reading. So it read it out loud. And you know, it then broke it into those zones for me. So I can pick and choose where I want to start, which is really nice with the zones. Uh, I can obviously increase or decrease, you know, the size of this at any moment. I can come in back into the menu option here. And on the far right hand side, that middle button, I can decide to switch between my reading views. Did I want to have it re read, excuse me? Um, in kind of that, uh, what's the word, teleprompter mode? Do I want to have it read in the ticker tape mode? Or do I want to come back into my zone mode? 
and there are my zones. Another uh, neat feature about the zones, if you hit the contrast color button, Mike, you can yep. cycle through and change. So if it's easier for a student to see a certain color contrast, you can change the, the, the color of the numbers. See, that was my stumper there, Justine. I didn't know it did that. <laughs> <laughs> oh and yeah, I found all the cool things. <laughs> so that's super cool. So, and that I'm assuming is through your preset. So if you chose those colors as your color contrasts, that's why I only have a couple that are here because those are the ones I had checked off earlier when we were demoing that. So super cool, that's neat. And, you know, I just have always liked the zones because it just lets you jump to right where you wanna be. I'm just zooming in right now using the plus button. I can also pinch to zoom because this is touchscreen. And if I wanted, you know, to start at number 10, zone 10. Six, so where does the battery go? It's usually the entire. And I can hit play. Entire floor of the vehicle. Having such a large and low to the ground power train helps when hugging corners. But it could. This article is about electric vehicles too. So if anyone's questioning, that's what that's uh, reading about. Uh, so where does the battery go? Uh, so that's, that's really neat. And so that's, that's your scanning there when I was scanning in. Um, you know, on that, that half of the page of the Reader's Digest magazine. All right, great. So we've, we've scanned a file. Now, if we want to save it, can you show us how to save a file on Juno? I can. So if you wanted to save this, and this is another cool feature with this that I really like, because what if in class, I'm given a handout from a teacher, or I'm at home and I have a question on homework, and I, you know, my parents are like, we don't know what you're doing. We're not, you know, we didn't go to school for that, whatever. And then the student goes back into school, they can actually at home take a picture of the problem that they're struggling with and save it into this Juno, then go into school and pull that file up and say to the teacher, hey, I'm struggling with this or vice versa. If they're struggling at school and they wanna go home and show you know, their parents or re you know, study this. So what I'm gonna do to save this is on the bottom right-hand side, you'll see the little floppy disk. I click on that and it says save document. I'm gonna click yes. File is saved, okay. This is super neat too. So do I wanna record an audio tag to this? This is gonna help you identify what some of these documents are. You can imagine once you save 25, 30, 100 files onto this Juno, you might not know whether you're coming or going with those things, right? You're like, wait a minute, where is that file or what is that file that I want? So I can add an audio tag to this. So I'm gonna hit yes. And then up in the middle comes my record button. I'm saving this as the electric vehicle magazine article. I hit stop. I'm saving this as the electric vehicle magazine article. So I was able to audio tag that. I don't know if you were able to hear that clearly, um, but it played back the audio of me saying what I was saving it as. And I can then play that again. I can re-record it if I want. The bottom left, I can just hit to go back. And that brings me back to my document. And now this is saved onto my Juno, which is really nice. Not that we want a really long tag or anything, but do you know if there's a, a limit to how long those tags can be? You know, I don't know if there is. Is there just in a limit to the audio tag of how long you can record? Oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know actually how long. I, I don't think it's super long, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. And I feel like that, that, that I recorded was longer than most might be, but I mean, I'm, oh I'm, yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> you might just say, so, I mean, I'm sure that it's got enough that you can get the gist of what you're saving, but I can always find that out if someone really wants to know too, Paul, you're the one, the daily double stumper there, Paul. That's, that's the stumper right there. Yes. <laughs> so, um, um, but yeah, I know normally I just save like math problems or, you know, something quick, but what you did was longer than I thought it even could do. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but it is a nice option to have that in there. All right, perfect. That's a, that's a really good feature. Really helps out keeping those files straight. So our last set of questions, we're going to turn it over to Greg to start talking about uh, external connections. Awesome. 
I'm not going to stump you, uh, Mike. I'm not going to ask Thanks, about any, like what precious metals are inside that or anything like that. So we're going <laughs> to start with. Uh, so first off, is is the Juno just a standalone device, or can you bring in documents from from other sources? Great question. So you can bring documents in from other sources, which is super cool. So I actually, um, you know, have used. I've got a USB uh, drive here that's USB on one side and USB-C on the other side. So from my laptop, and I apologize, the USB-C thumb drive doesn't fit in on the side while I have my HDMI cable in there. So I can't show this um, process exactly live, like showing it, but what I can do is walk you through what I did. Um, so in here, what I did was, I'm gonna exit out of this file here. Um, I plugged my USB drive into the Juno and it actually uh, up on the, when I go to my main menu on the top left is a file folder. When I click that, this shows me the files that are here. And if I were to have my um, USB drive in there, it actually would allow me to import files or export files from the Juno. So that file that I just saved, that was the, um, which was the text file, which if I click on that now, I'm gonna click on this bottom left-hand text file. So this is a Juno text file. And when I open that, uh, this was actually something that I saved earlier that was a simple text file. This is a sample document that's coming from a text file on my PC to the Juno. Uh, so what I did was I opened up a text file on my computer, typed in it, saved it onto my thumb drive, and then the Juno recognized it when I plugged my thumb drive into it. Uh, so you've got the option of downloading or moving files over that are text. So TXT files, uh, PDF files, docx files, which are Word documents, JPEG files, uh, which are picture files, and PNG files, which are portable network graphics, which are, again, a graphic picture file. So any of those can be transferred over to the Juno. And once they're on there, Again, get into the main menu, click on that. And I want to show you something that I thought was pretty cool. So at the bottom, it's kind of scrolling through the, um, the name of that file. And there's that one that I saved earlier, which was the electric vehicle magazine file. And if I open up the Juno text, that was that Juno text one that I had. And there's also, earlier I saved a couple pages from the Juno Quick Start Guide. I saved three pages from that to the USB drive and then transferred it over. This is a PDF file. Um, I do want to make the point that this is also already stored in the Juno. So when you buy it, another nice feature is the fact that this is stored in there. So you don't have to go to your computer. I'm probably answering your question way more, Greg, than you wanted me to. So no, you're doing a great job. <laughs> you're answering actually all of my questions in my list, so you're good. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Great. I'm ahead of the game, I guess. <laughs> I guess I was worried you were going to stump me, so I'm just trying to, you He's know, covering lab all it all out. Bases. Yeah. I love it. Um, but I thought that this was cool because this was a PDF that I pulled from my laptop over to this. And if I click on the little file over on the right-hand side, it opens that document. Boom, here we are. We've got our zone. So if I want to have this read to me, I can have it read to me. If I click on the left-hand side, the bottom left, to get to our menu, you'll notice this is three pages. Up at the top, it says this is page one of three. I can easily toggle over to my next page. And I want to pause for a second on this page because this is a great image showing you that power button, your color mode up and down, your camera, your capture button, your zoom in, your zoom out. Click back there. I can go back to page two, go back to page one. You know, you can cycle through all these. And this just, again, shows you a lot of functionality here. And if you want to change the view from the exact view, you can do that as well. So a lot of flexibility and functionality um, built right into this. So Mike, when you, when you brought those files over, um, you know, the, the file names can be pretty long once you've brought that over, can you add a, a new tag to the files that have been brought over, an audio tag? So you can add an audio tag to it, yeah. So you won't be able to change the text name right. of the file, but you can definitely add an audio tag to it, yeah. 
Got it. So that the student doesn't have to watch that whole scrolling text every time. So that's good. Exactly. Okay, cool. And if you, you wanted to from, oh, go ahead, Justine. Oh, you were probably just about to say it. You can change the, 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 the name of the file on the computer. So if you're bringing something over and you specifically want to say, you know, this is lesson 17, um, you can name that on the computer and it will bring that file name over to the, the Juno and you'll be able to find it in the file manager Fantastic. pretty easy with the cool. naming the file. Yeah. Awesome. And that, and I saw Helga posted a question of, does it have a file system? Yeah, there is a file manager and that's where he's, he's pulling these files from when he's, uh, when he's seeing the list of the files, um, that are in there. Mike, you brought these over on a thumb drive, but can you connect the Juno directly to a computer? You can. Yeah. So what it would do is using that USB-C cable that comes with it. That's also the charging cable. Um, you can actually connect this and then drag the files right from the computer over to the Juno. The Juno will show up as kind of an external hard drive almost, the same way it would if you were to plug in a USB drive on your laptop. Uh, so you can plug the Juno in that way and then drag the files from or to the Juno, from or to the computer. Perfect, cool. Um, so we'll move past uh, files questions and go more towards the real world scenario of these tools are used in a variety of different ways in the classroom, right? So you talked about using them for scanning and reading, for distance, for access to external documents and things like that. One of these, one of the ways that students often use portable magnifiers is for exams. Um, and due to the, the, you know, diverse ways that you can use this device with external things and, and uh, such, uh, and we know that our students can be quite creative. Um, I'll, I'll use the word creative. Uh, <laughs> is there a way that we can restrict access to only using this tool um, in certain ways? So, so during an exam, say restricting them from accessing their notes that they would want to put on this file or something like that. Great question, Greg. And there is. Um... So you can then do your little like evil laugh, like, <laughs> like you can't, <laughs> you can't cheat. Um, so there is a way to do that. And it's kind of a secret roundabout way, which this was uh, me testing this. And I was like, oh, this is really an interesting way to get into this. But you can also add um, a code to it. So what I'm going to do is show you how to do this. So on the bottom left hand side, I'm going to click on that menu option again. And then I'm going to click on the top left to get me into my main menu. And then on the bottom right, I'm going to click that settings button. So from the settings button on the bottom right, I'm then going to click on my system settings. And from the system settings, you have to do a little secret tap. So this is like the secret knock to get into the clubhouse. So you have to tap the battery indicator, which up, is up on the top left corner of the screen, right? I'm going to tap that seven times in less than three seconds and then press the red camera button, which is the capture button, the top right hand button on the actual Juno. So I did it. So seven taps and then press that red button. This brings you to your teacher settings. So since this is scrolling across, um, it might be easier for me, I'll, I'll read out loud what the options are or what the settings are, but you'll notice that I can just drag my finger up the screen here to show you what these are as well. But you've got maximum volume. So if you wanna control the volume level for the individual, you can do that. Do you wanna lock out the transfer or disallow transfer to USB? Disallow transfer from the USB? Disallow opening files? Disallow saving files? disallow the capturing, disallow recognition, uh, disallow reading, allowable recognition languages. So if you wanna lock out certain languages, uh, how long do you want these settings to stay for? So I do wanna show that. So if you go to expire settings, you can actually set this from, the default is four hours and 15 minutes. So this I think was pretty cool because I can see and I can imagine a teacher coming in, setting a teacher setting, and then being like, uh-oh, how do I change this? Knowing the fact that it's just gonna expire after a set time should take a little bit of stress 
off of you, you know, less anxiety. It's not a forever setting. So you can set this to however long you want. Um, if you want to reset the teacher settings, you can reset the teacher settings all together. And you can also reset to factory settings from here as well. So I'm going to do uh, disallow file share and disallow transfer just to show you. So once I chose something, you'll notice that down the bottom right hand side, a little arrow popped up. When I click on that, it brings me over into my enter the locking code. So this locking code is what locks it out so that the student can't then change these settings themselves. So we'll just set it to all ones and then Hopefully click on guess the, that. No one will guess, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom right. And now that's set for the teacher settings. So um, if I come back in now to my teacher settings, so if they know that secret, you know, seven tap and the camera, so they may know that, but they're not going to guess your password. So this then lets them enter in that super secret passcode or you as the teacher and then unlock it again and come back in. Um, you know, so this is kind of one of those in-depth functionalities, but it's, it's definitely cool because the fact that you can customize this yet again to lock out some of that functionality so that the student can't, you know, open up a file that they shouldn't be while they're taking a test or, you know, if you want to customize it even deeper. Yeah, and that the, you know, we saw the scenario of somebody putting that pin um, and then writing it down on a post-it note and then losing that post-it note, right? So just yeah. knowing that even if you lose that pin, it's going to expire in four hours or whatever else, that the, the device will not be locked in that state forever um, does does allow, as Mike said, uh, you know, you to kind of relieve that anxiety a little bit. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a fantastic feature, and we we did kind of, you know, mask it with the 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 taps um, and things like that. But it's it is in. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Justine. I think this is in the user guide for the teachers, or it's it's available somewhere there so that they know. Yeah, uh, it's in it's in the user guide, so yeah. you can you can look up if you can't remember. Um, you can look up the the secret code if you mm -hmm. want to call it. That. The, you know, how to access those teacher settings. Yeah. That's great. Um, the last thing that uh, we want to talk about is a pretty realistic scenario. So you, you get through the semester, right? It's now the beginning of June, your students ready to move on and you're going to get a new student on your caseload in the fall who could be a, um, you know, eligible user for this device. Your student has saved a whole bunch of files on here, you know, manipulated all the settings, done everything. So how do we wipe it clean and start fresh for that new student next uh, next semester, Mike? Yeah, so that was inside that same thing. So inside that teacher um, settings option there, you can reset to factory um, defaults, basically, or reset to, to factory settings. And so there's the option through there. So on the bottom left again, to get into those teacher settings, uh, we can do that. And, or you can also come in, click on that main menu, and then you're going to click on the settings tab. And then you're going to click on the option for system settings on the bottom right. And then you're going to click on um, the bottom right hand one yet again. And that does reset settings. And that's going to bring you to the basically reset to defaults. And if I hit yes, it would reset that to the defaults. Um, I'm going to hit no just because I want to keep what settings I've done. But that will quickly and easily reset it to factory defaults for you. Um, awesome. I don't, and I didn't want to step on you, Greg, but I did want to also mention that when you do go into, so I'm just going back here. When I go into my main menu, top left-hand button again, if I click on the I for information, if you take anything from today's session, take this part of this away because in here on the bottom left is the support. In the middle is your manual. If I click on that button, this actually opens up the Juno manual. All 114 pages of it are here for your reading desires. So you can toggle through all of this and this will bring you through everything and you get all of your menu options here, what's in the box, 
I mean, just everything is is right there for you. So it's really nice. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Mike. This uh, this has been really cool to see live like this. I saw Ken's question. Is there is there some anything else on the market? that has these type of features. I think the answer to that question is not in this type of package that I know of. And, and Justine, you know about a lot more of these, um, you know, portable magnifiers than I do not using them as a user myself, but from, you know, our, our focus on this product was to really bring all the functionality that's in, or a lot of the functionality that's in, in a traditional desktop CCTV, and put it into something that's much more portable and, and dynamic like this. And so um, as far as I know, nothing with a, a seven inch screen that's this portable has this many features. I would agree there. Exactly. Yeah, you'll find these features in other magnifiers, but not in all, you know, all in one kind of place. <laughs> nothing, nothing this portable, so. No, no, definitely not. Well, I think that outside of Paul stumping you on a random question like that, I think you did pretty darn good. So, so huge yeah, applause there for great. Mike. Nice job, man. Um, Thank you. And we'll, Absolutely. Uh, good job, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. I appreciate that. Well, I'm going to hand things back over to Paul to wrap up. We've got one final poll question for you about some of the file types that Juno can open and use. Uh, put any ending questions, follow-up questions in the chat, and we can get to those as Paul reads us out. It looks like some questions are coming in as we speak. So uh, this last question is a choose all that apply. So the Judo can open which of the following file types? TXT, PDF, DOCX, which are Word files, JPEG, PNG, or XLSX, which are Excel files. Which of those can Juno open? Select all the ones that apply. I hope everyone was listening closely for those. Yes, because we did put one in to stump you, not stump Mike. <laughs> you sure all it's right. only one? <laughs> I think it's only one. Hmm, maybe no. it stumped me. All right, and how about Paul, you go through discoveries in our uh, final Juno page, and then we will answer some questions as we're ending this webinar. So we've discovered that Juno has got five camera modes and you can use it for close-up and distance viewing. Uh, that it supports multiple languages and you're able to change the audio output and the speed of reading. Uh, users have the option to have the menu read out for easier navigation. Also helps if, if you just have fatigue, uh, visual fatigue at the time as well. Um, Text-to-speech supports users that have visual fatigue. So the speech is very helpful. Uh, you don't have to use it just for that, but it's just a great feature. And then audio tags, they make finding documents a breeze. It's so much easier to find a, a document with a actual name other than just a bunch of numbers and letters that, that randomly... Uh, would happen if you saved a file that you scanned, for instance. And let's look at the Juno. Um, as we said, it is available on quota for $1,095. If you're a non-quota purchaser, the price is $1,295. There is a one-year warranty. And if you have questions, of course, if you need support, um, can't find it, don't know what to do, uh, give our customer experience department a uh, call, or you can email us. Um, Mike can help out. Uh, Justine, um, lots of ways to get support uh, if you can't find that information. And we'll get that closing quote for you in just a bit. Um, do we have any other questions, Betsy Ann, that we need to, to go over? I wanted to, sorry, Betsy, I wanted to make one quick comment. Yeah. I saw someone mentioned that they were using the Jupiter, uh, which is another APH product with students. And I think that this is a great complement to that because the Jupiter is amazing, but portability aspect of this, uh, you know, it's nice to be able to then kind of have both uh, the flexibility of that. So I just wanted to make that comment because that's another product that I love uh, is the Jupiter, but this complements it very well. Yeah, and you get the OCR with the Juno, so. Yes. 
if you if you want that piece that'll that's really helpful for the portability absolutely so one question that did come in was how have teachers used this device how has it been received by older rehab clients so this is really new i mean this started shipping i believe what the end of may um you know there was some delays uh getting it out the door due to you know covid related shipping issues and stuff and then uh school just started back up recently so um i've heard some good feedback but justine do you have any from specific teachers directly um i haven't heard specifically any any feedback um, from the rehab uh, professionals out there yet like you said it's still so new i yeah. do have a um, customer uh, feedback survey that I, i'm putting out in the aph news uh, next month in november so if you look out for that um, if you want to fill out the, the customer satisfaction survey, that would be uh, great for you to give us some feedback on that. And I Absolutely. Would love, yeah, I would love that. I, I mean, maybe we do a follow-up webinar once this is now in the hands of people using it with best use case scenarios. And mm -hmm. we are open to having, if anybody on this call purchases a Juno after this, or you're using one currently, I know there were a couple of you on here that had them already. Um, reach out to us. We'd love to team up with you and have you join us on a webinar to talk about how you use it. Absolutely. So uh, I know all of you will be taking the follow-up survey monkey. So you can also give us some information there to let us know how you're using the Juno, uh, what other frequently asked questions you have that you'd like answered in a future webinar or any best use cases. For the poll, we had great response. You guys Got it. Uh, only 32% of you that the Juno can open XLSX. That is an Excel file, and that is the one that Juno cannot open. So great job, everyone. Uh, for those of you following along for ACV REP credit, uh, your closing code today is answers. A-N-S-W-E-R-S, -E answers. Hopefully you got your questions answered today. Big thanks to Mike, Justine, and Greg, and Paul as well for sharing us the, sharing with us these frequently asked questions and running through the answers. I think we, we didn't stump Mike, but we did get the best question answered, which is, why does Mike have a Reader's Digest handy? Uh, <laughs> that was my question. It's so, got good jokes, right? <laughs> it does, yes. It's got good stories, yeah. Um, just real quick, I just wanted to say I did put that link into the, the Juno survey in the chat. So if you want to take that survey, it's awesome. right there for you in the chat. That's great. Thank you. Please do take that, that survey as well. Your closing code today was answers. A-N-S-W-E-R-S. -S. So thanks, everybody. Thanks to ACS Captions for doing a great job always. Thanks to all of our presenters. So many presenters today. Um, this and was awesome. APH, you guys do a wonderful <laughs> event. All of your webinars. I mean, you guys just put on such a great event always. Uh, I know you do so many things and I don't know how you keep up with everything, <laughs> but you do a lot and you're a great group of people. So I love working with you and I, thanks for having me as the guest uh, to present today. Well, thank you. All right, everyone that wraps up our Thursday. So, well, maybe not for Greg living in Wisconsin, but, um, you know, central time, not yet, <laughs> but <laughs> have a good thanks. rest of your day, everyone. And thanks, I'll be in touch when we get some survey responses uh, wrapped up for, for Juno FAQs. Thanks. Thank Bye, everyone. everyone. Thanks so much. Bye.